Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College. Do you or anyone you know suffer from allergies? Our guest today is Dr. Frank Lichtenberger, is an expert in the field of allergy and immunology and an author of the new book called Allergic to Life, How the Human Body Rejects the Modern World. He is going to tell us how major changes in daily life have led to increased states of bodily inflammation and increasing cases of allergies worldwide. Dr. Lichtenberger, welcome to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And as you hear, my voice is a little crackly because of an allergy. So I think I'm this interview is going to go quite well because I do relate. Well, we can we can get right to that. Tell me a little bit about why you decided to dedicate your career to allergies. When I was uh, uh, in, in medical school and looking at the different disciplines, I had a very tough time picking and I, I very much enjoyed in, internal medicine or, or kind of a whole body type approach with a longstanding interest in, in scientific research and discovery. Immunology itself has uh, aspects of all the uh, fundamental organ systems, as well as the the, the entirety of the body, including stress responses. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, allergies and immunology r- roll over hand in hand with uh, h- how a- a- any human body interfaces and, and responds to its immediate and, and uh, uh, long-term environment. And I also got a little bit lucky. I, I really, really enjoy it. And, um, and I'm glad I made that decision. So like me, do you personally suffer from allergies? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I am on allergy shots. My uh, very allergic to our dog. I have asthma. Have had it for uh, multiple years. I'm managed. Uh, my my symptoms are mostly managed. Environmental allergies are extremely common, and I happen to have you know great staff here, so I've I have good care. So I'm, I'm also very lucky with that. So I'm looking at your book. It's entitled allergic to life, how the human body rejects the modern world. But is this book for healthcare providers? Is it for patients? Is it for scientists? Who is this book written for? You know, I think that there are certainly some some providers out there that uh, would, would probably find it interesting, but it really is written more for the other the other side, uh, for people that are that have been receiving care. And, you know, you know, healthcare providers receive care just like everybody else. But the the voice or what what I am speaking to is is really a reflection of the patient encounters that I have had um, over the years of a, a increasing uh, severity and unpredictability of uh, inflammatory and, and allergic reactions of all types. So it, I've, I've I've written it for a patient any any person out there that's. You know, feeling like they don't fit in with the with their environment and and maybe not getting the best answers from the current healthcare system. So uh, I, I hope that answers the question, but I, I believe it's mostly for for patients. Describe for me an allergy. Is it an immunologic issue starting from birth, or is this something that appears as you age? It can be both. Allergy, as as we use the you know, the strict medical definition, refers to what's called a hypersensitivity, uh, as in more than just being sensitive to something, being extremely sensitive, and that goes to what the body does in response and and so as of now being springtime you know we're inhaling pollens from from the trees that are opening up and in bloom these are very small particles that are not out to hurt uh uh, hurt our our bodies or, or cause infections and having swelling and sneezing that's a bit strong of a response that that's an overreaction if you will and so that's the basis of, of what we call an allergy. And, that, and that's an environmental allergy. Now, that's that's almost half our population of, of varying different degrees. But getting into things like drug allergies or um, other types of molecular allergies or, or even some physical activity can cause a hypersensitivity. 
Um, some of those can be in our genetic code or, or they can be developed over time. Most environmental allergies will start at a very young age, um, and it, but they can develop at any time. Uh, we're seeing people in their, in their 60s, 70s, even, even 80s who are developing new food allergies that they did not have before. So there, there's no real restriction on it. Um, but it, we see mostly, we see a lot of kids, a lot of kids come in with runny noses. With an allergic response, does it occur uh, very mildly at first when you introduce to the allergen and then it's a cumulative that every time you expose the symptoms worsen? Or usually is it an immediate severe reaction upon the first introduction of the allergen? That, that will depend on the allergen. M most, most of these big time responses uh, require the, the, the immune system have encountered it before. So if we look at things like hymenopter stings, bee stings, for example, there are people out there that have been stung and have never had an allergic reaction. However, with a subsequent sting, they can develop a big time allergic reaction called anaphylaxis. In those cases, there, there's not really an, any warning because they've had several stings and have not had reaction, but then the body develops the hypersensitivity and that can lead to the whole body becoming inflamed very, very quickly in a very dangerous condition. Now with, with drug allergies, we believe that most of them need to be encountered beforehand by the body in a, in a weakened or a vulnerable state where it develops a, 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 a directed response to the medication. But there, there are absolutely different stories. You know, people that will get, like for me, I'm allergic to my dog. I didn't know I was allergic until we had him for years. And so it, it developed so slowly that you know, I, I didn't even feel it coming on until you know, my wife was like, you know, you're sneezing a lot, you're blowing your nose a lot, and, and that's, that's, that's not like you. This is what I do for a living. So it, it, the, the dog allergy snuck up on me, but some of these can just pop out of the blue seemingly from nowhere. But we do need a sensitization event. We, we, most of the time, our bodies do need to encounter it before we develop the, the really high powered allergy to it. So are allergies an inflammatory response, the way the body responds? Meaning? Absolutely. You know, they're, they're referred to as a, a type one inflammatory or a hypersensitivity response. It's absolutely inflammation. Um, you know, we, we, as we learn what, what inflammation is, you know, there's a, a skin color change. It'll it generally the capillaries will dilate, the, the skin will turn red or warm, um, the mucous membranes will, will, will swell, produce fluid and more mucus, uh, people can start wheezing. I, I mean, this is, the body is changing itself rapidly. What sets allergies apart in, in regards to an inflammatory response is how quickly they occur. I mean, people can go from, from zero to sick or very affected with within only within seconds. And an allergy an allergic reaction is one of the few inflammatory responses that can really do that. Um, I mean, if people get like a strep throat or, or even a, a COVID virus, they'll have several days of feeling off before they really kind of are maximum maximally dealing with their inflammatory uh, response. So again, excellent. The timing of, of allergies very, very quick. So can you tell me why I remember growing up and I didn't see so many peanut allergies as I am seeing today. Can you give me a little bit of why that is? What I talk about in, in the book, Allergic to Life, it are those changes. Now, I'm right at my fifth decade of life. So I was born in the 70s. We did not have anybody having food allergy. I mean, that was right. unheard of right. um, you know, at, the, at the lunch table in the 80s. And, and now there are action plans. I mean, the federal government has gotten involved with food allergies. And that's the point, as in these younger bodies are dealing with their immune systems having a higher level of action. They're having more allergic responses, They're having more asthma, more runny noses, mm -hmm. more eczema, and then more food allergies. And I mean, it, looking at the data over the past 30 years, it, it seemingly has come out of nowhere from only a few thousand emergency room visits to over 20 to 30,000 emergency room visits a year for a food allergy related anaphylaxis. 
I mean, that is staggering. Now, th it's not limited to the United States. It's happening all over the world, even in, in countries don't, that do not have the same level of economic development. The changes to our environment are largely responsible for the actions of the immune system. So, I mean, we'll joke around in the office about, hey, you got to live in a bubble, you know, and, and, um, and, and that's not too far from the truth for some people that their level of allergies, the level of how sensitive their body is, makes it very difficult to, to, to perform or, or even enjoy some of the activities of daily living. I find that those patients very tough, very strong, enjoy trying to working through it and, and helping them get, get to a much better quality of life. So again, very good question with, with the, this kind of almost an explosion of food allergy, but that is not it. I mean, it's not just food allergy, medication allergies and episodes of anaphylaxis, sting anaphylaxis. It, it's it is uh, rapidly increasing and it does not look like it's tapering off. So we really are talking about you. You talk about a human ecosystem. Is that yeah. what you mean by that? That term in your book? So the, the, the human ecosystem, a term we, we use to reflect that your body, my body is not just a, a human. There are billions upon billions of bacteria uh, yeasts and, and other microorganisms that, that are in a state of equilibrium, M much like a tundra or a desert or grasslands that, and, and if we look at an ecosystem like a national park where well, they'll, they'll change where a river turns or, or they'll, they'll remove an invasive species, there, there's just a cascade of effects mm -hmm. that can continue on for years or, or decades that are almost unpredictable. So if we look at our human body like one of these ecosystems, but then say we get rid of 40 to 50 percent of the bacteria that our gut is using for digestion, that's an altered ecosystem mm -hmm. that we're still trying to understand. Mm -hmm. and, and there's an ecosystem in our gut, in, in our nasal passages, on our skin. Each area on our body, almost each square centimeter ha has a different density of oil glands versus sweat glands versus how much friction it undergoes during the day. It, and, and it all has these gradient type effects with what type of microorganisms can live on it. And, and taking an antibiotic for a, a throat infection, that can affect skin ecosystem, that can affect the lung ecosystem, that can affect uh, the gut ecosystem. And, and this changed, this, this became a altered ecosystem before we knew it. Um, and I got I got to experience that uh, uh, in medical school, which, which I, I started in the 90s. We didn't have too much of a concept even back then that that gut bacteria was really important mm -hmm. for a healthy human body, a health, you know, healthy human function. We're really going after it now. Now, I don't want to say that no doctor or scientist, there, there absolutely were doctors that were that were shouting the alarm bells uh, uh, decades ago of, about gut flora and the, and the microbiome. And, and they, they didn't get the they didn't get the limelight. They didn't get the the attention back then, but they certainly are getting the attention now. And so the, the human ecosystem has been altered on the inside, on the surface, not, not only the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, how we interact socially, but the millions upon billions of, of these microbes, they all have a desire to, to live and replicate and they interact with our gut immune system. That has changes that have lasting effects that we're still trying to figure out. So when we refer to the, the, the human ecosystem, that, that's it's just to say it's been altered. It is different, and that can affect a different human being that has a different genetic makeup, that has different um, uh, historical infections, and affect them in a, in a, in a, in a, a much more uh, almost seemingly random way. And you know, current research is, is fascinating in terms of the diversity of the microbiome of the gut being important for things like autoimmune disease. And, and that, that is, you know, the, the, when, when, when they started using antibiotics, you know, less than 100 years ago, nobody was thinking that, that this might actually affect autoimmunity at that time. But we went for it. We started making antibiotics and we started knocking out the good, good bacteria before we even knew what we were doing. And so we, we and, and so the point is that we all have altered ecosystems. All of the bacteria on, on every, every, you know, every American, um, 
it is not what it was a hundred years ago. It is changed. And we're not really sure what it was supposed to be to begin with. So, it, and and, the, and there's not a solution there. Okay, like I, I don't have the solution to what we need. What, what what's the right probiotic to take or prebiotic? It, it's only an open thought process to say, hmm, my body is not behaving the way I think it should. What are the reasons why? And absolutely, the microbiome uh, of, of the body and how the human body, with the immune system being the key interaction point of those bacteria, um, that's that is what I refer to as the human ecosystem. Fascinating. You're listening to your family's health on the Voice of Nassau Community College, ninety point three WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard, and my guest today is Dr. Lichtenberger. He's an expert in the field of allergy and immunology, and the author of a new book called Allergic to Life, How the Human Body Rejects the Modern World. Can you say that our bodies are more predisposed to autoimmune diseases because of our sensitivity or allergies? And how is it connected to body systems like our nervous system, like uh, predisposition for cancers or or, or the kind of uh, inflammatory diseases? The you know allergies are a reaction to uh, something in the environment. So if we take out that environment or we avoid it, um, there will be no inflammatory response. And there are there are there are crossovers to that. The exam- example I use in the book is the uh, historical reference of, of what we call scarlet fever, rheumatic fever, where a strep infection causes dramatic post-infectious inflammatory changes in the body. Now, that's not an autoimmune disease, but it's a overreaction or a triggered inflammatory response. And now that requires something in the environment, but it's not just the body. Now, celiac disease, which is a food that we ingest that can trigger inflammation all throughout the body, not just in the gut, but in, in our joints and in our skin, that's another environmental triggered autoimmune condition. Now, pure autoimmunity, which, which we link to different basic labels of each individual's white blood cells called, called a lymphocyte, a T lymphocyte, versus the production of an antibody, those are self-perpetuating inflammatory responses to the host. We don't necessarily think that they need the continued stimulation with the gluten or the strep bacteria or pollen to perpetuate. And yes, the more times you stimulate the, the, the immune system, the more times the more times you lift a weight, the bigger the muscle gets. That's just an adaptive response. The more times you engage the immune system, if you don't wear it out, it's going to come back stronger. And people that are predisposed to autoimmunity the more times they encounter infections or the more times their body becomes inflamed, the higher the risk they develop that autoimmunity. So our genetics have not changed in the past 50 to 100 years at all. That is not enough time for a massive change or a genetic drift to cause the increases in autoimmunity that we're seeing. But genetics are important. So we're talking about risk. So Yes, absolutely. The environment is responsible to those vulnerable people that have this risk. And we are just now figuring out some of these risk factors down to the individual molecules or even the individual gene. I, I can't say we, I'm not actually on any of these scientific teams. You know, I, I read the, the journals as they come out, like I, like I read a comic book. But it, it is absolutely fascinating what we're seeing, what can lead to a form of arthritis versus what can lead to a form of colitis and also what can lead to runny noses. So 100 percent, the more an immune system is stimulated, um, the more that stimulation is going to cause changes. And those changes can lead to a perpetual inflammatory response that we call an autoimmune condition. I hope I hope that addressed those because that was very good. Is that we, we went from uh, allergies to inflammatory responses yes, and, and, and autoimmunity, all all want absolutely important to address. So I hope I got to all of those. Key no, points. I think you did. How do I find out what I'm allergic to? Are is there a specific test for food allergies versus environmental allergies? So I I, I recommend 
that, and I'm a board certified allergist immunologist, and I'm 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 going to recommend that if anybody, you know, including including yourself, yes. um, has what what appear to be severe symptoms or or symptoms that get in the way of of, of what you want to do with your life, um, that you know, seeing an an allergist that has has gone through medical school residency and then the extra couple of years. Um, to get a uh, to be identified. Now, that is not the only way to get tested. There are plenty of tests uh, that are available through LabCorp that look at IgE as in Edward, and those lead to the hypersensitivity. Those are the allergies. So, if I wanted to send a, a allergy panel on, on on you, I would look at what are the pollens that are predominant in this area of the country? And can we check a level on you? Now, that would give us an answer that has uh, different numbers that have a different level. And those, those do a pretty good job of corresponding to the symptoms that you'd have. Now, with food allergy, it's a little bit more complicated because food spends a lot more time in our body and it engages a, a, a lot more different areas of our a body and our immune system. And so IgE testing is, which we would look for pollen, is really not enough for food allergy. So like if we got an IgE test for food, but somebody had celiac disease, which is a gluten triggered autoimmune condition, that Ig test or that allergy test would not find it. Okay. And, and now, that, now that's a key problem that, that I run into when I see, when I see new patients is that they'll get an allergy test and, I'll, and it'll be a negative to wheat. But if they eat gluten, they'll, they'll have swollen joints and, and severe belly pain. And it's a different way of testing. So absolutely. Lab, uh, and, and I don't mean to mention any lab companies specifically. I, I think they all run about the same, that those are available and, and, and any uh, licensed practitioner is a- absolutely able to order and interpret those those examples. Sometimes, though, the subtlety in, in interpreting them is a little bit difficult. And, and, and I give that example. It's, that's one example, it's, but it's a main example. Um, that if there is some concern or if it's not absolutely straightforward, it's good to have a look over. Um, and so, so there is there can be some error in interpretation, but the testing is is uh, is is widely available. Now, skin testing is a very rapid way of testing. It's also very itchy. That's good for environmental allergens, food allergens, drug allergens, and, and even bee sting allergens. So there there's more than one way. Uh, a blood test or the skin test for almost every type of allergy. So if if you can't come off antihistamines for skin testing or somebody's really phobic of needles, which is a real thing, can still absolutely get tested. So I'm looking at your book here and it says one of the sections talk about too much of a good thing can be bad. Too much of what? Well, there, there is a, well talking about good and bad is a framework that when we talk with patients is is you know, a lot of times we'll gloss over um, relatively complicated topics and they will say, well, is that good or is that bad? Well, you know, that, that that's all in the, in the relativity to what we're talking about. Right. So, yes, if we have too much of a protective uh, immune globulin or, or too much of an immune action, well, it's a good thing until we hit a point of it going overboard. Right. And and so it, there there's a slot there's a balance there there's a there's a there's a uh, an area a happy zone for almost every body function. So th- thinking of things as being too good or good or bad or too bad um, has to reflect what the body's doing in that moment. So running a test on somebody who's very sick and running that same test on that same person when they're well can give two very different results. So. It all, it, it all boils down to what that body is doing at that moment. And so as, as we seek to uh, digest these somewhat complex topics in, into easier to digest topics, you know, kind of removing the good, bad, uh, uh, evil, bad, evil, good, uh, kind of all or none framework and just saying there's just too much is the, the, 
most of the message there. And it, and it, it is a complicated, it is a complicated message. Now, um, and I guess it's all relative to the individual who has uh, an allergy, you know, what's too, too much uh, or too and, little. And what, what is, what is too much for me might not be too much for you. That is right. Uh, uh, and, and that could be anything from coffee to conversation. Yes. So, uh, doctor, how do we get your book? How do we get in contact with you for more information about allergies? This is such a complex topic. Well, thank you. Um, the, the book is available at major online retailers, including Amazon, Target and Springer Nature. I did see it on Barnes and Noble the, the other day, but I, I, I and I believe that they are uh, committed to carrying it uh, for that. Now, in terms of a, if a very active patient centered practice in North Carolina uh, at Piedmont Healthcare in uh, Iredell County, North Carolina. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, if there was a uh, calling the office uh, or um, uh, contacting us through our website is probably the best way to get in touch. And your website a, is? I'm sorry? Your website? PiedmontHealthcare.com. Okay. And you'll, you'll find outstanding providers there if you're in the North Carolina area. But we are the allergy immunologist uh, uh, discipline there. But again, please check it out. It's on, on Amazon or um, any of the other retailers that were, that were mentioned, including Barnes & Noble's and Target. Well, thank you for being here. Dr. Lichtenberger is an expert in the field of allergy and immunology and the author of a new book called Allergic to Life, How the Human Body Rejects the Modern World. We thank you for giving us this important information, and we hope you continue to stay healthy and keep doing the great work that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. This is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, and we want to thank you for listening to this week's edition of Your Family's Health. We'd like to get your feedback on your family's health. Send your comments by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu. Podcasts of today's show are available on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. This program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.